I'm well known for being a nervous, anxious person. People who know me could describe me as someone who tries to blend in, who tries to avoid meeting new people even when I've actively chosen to participate in a new activity or go to a new place. People who know me wouldn't expect me to get up in front of a camera and start this conversation, but I'm going to do it anyway. When I came to examine this anxiety within myself so that I could change it, I found that something more sinister lay at the heart of the problem. And to tell you about that, I'll have to tell you a story. In my first year of secondary school, I had my first ever humanities lesson. I don't really remember what that lesson was about, but I remember the teacher, a woman in her mid forties, and I remember this activity. I remember it because it was the first time in my life that I realized I wasn't like my peers, that I could never be like them. That teacher handed out a piece of paper, a half of A4 poorly cut on a blunted guillotine to every boy in the class. Another piece to every girl. When I looked at that paper, I felt my first real taste of anxiety welling up inside of me. What that sheet asked of me was a simple description, along with an outline of a person to fill in. My ideal boyfriend. I could see that the sheet then I could see that the sheet the boy nearest to me had was different. His said, my ideal girlfriend. I'd never put much thought into attraction aged 11. I hadn't really needed to. Childish crushes disguised themselves as friendships and inspirational moments. It had never occurred to me before, but suddenly it dawned on me. I wanted the other sheet. At almost the exact same time, another realization crashed down couldn't ask for the other sheet. I had never considered before that it might not be normal to want to date someone of the same sex. It hadn't actually even occurred to me that you could, but with the sudden knowledge that I wanted to, I felt it. This crushing sense of difference, I could never fit in. I could never be like my classmates. I was alone. And at the time, I was sure there was nobody else in the world like me. This is a story I've never told to anyone, partially because objectively it seems so insignificant, but mostly because I didn't really want anyone to know this about me. Most of the people in my life don't know I'm a lesbian, and the ones that do think that I'm proud of who I am. How could I tell them all I felt was shame? Studies suggest that I'm not the only person struggling with this feeling of self-hatred. According to context.org, up to 37% of the LGB population remains in the closet. And if we look at the ones who aren't, a study by Fredrickson and Goldson in 2012 shows that LGBT adults were more likely to suffer from poor general health, disability and depression than their heterosexual counterparts. And part of this problem lies in the way we're treated and the environment we grow up in. When I was first outed against my will, aged 14, I felt more shame than before. Girls would question whether I should be allowed to change with them, to use the girls' bathrooms. People I had never spoken to would approach me in the school hallways asking incredibly personal questions and offering rude statements. How do you know you're gay if you've never kissed a man? What's wrong with you? You just need a real man. I can fix you. This particular comment came from a boy, a child whose backpack was bigger than he was and already he was prejudiced against me. I sat through classes while my classmates stage whispered about me from five feet away, and I didn't say anything to the slurs that followed me through the school. That night I told my parents, not because I wanted to, but because I didn't want my siblings to get there before I did. My parents had separated when I was a child, so I had to tell them separately. I've since forgiven my ex-classmates, but I still bear that pain. I carry it with me every day. Later, aged 15 or 16, I gave in to that self-hatred that had taken a deep root inside me. I stopped fighting it. People had stopped calling me dyke, queer, or man-hating bitch, but I still heard it. It was inside my head. The first thing I heard when I woke up, and the last thing on my mind at night. I started hurting myself, and sometimes I thought it would be better if I was dead. At this point, you're probably wondering why I'm telling you this. Well, if we agree that the way people treat us deeply affects our sense of self, we have to see that the other part of the problem lies in how we treat ourselves. It's not just LGBT plus individuals who experience this. 
I'm using my personal experience here as an example. I guarantee that at one point or another, you will have felt worthless, stupid. You will have berated yourself for something you couldn't help. You will have actively avoided telling someone something you wanted to say, and it's this that we can change. It isn't an easy change. The first step is forgiving yourself, which does sound counterintuitive. You don't need to forgive yourself for who you are, but for how you've treated yourself. Until you recognise that the attacks you put yourself under are wrong, you can't move past it. You feel like you deserve it. And to get through that, you have to forgive. For me, I'm still working on forgiving myself. Telling you this feels an awful lot like a confession, and I can already feel that self-hatred creeping back in, trying to find itself a place to take root, to grow. But if step one is forgiveness, step two has to be acceptance. You have to learn to accept who you are. A lot of focus is put on tolerance these days, but tolerance reaches only so far. You cannot be authentic while you still don't accept yourself, which leads to step three, learning to love yourself. I can feel you rolling your eyes. You'll have heard this a lot. Loving yourself is obviously easier said than done, but I promise you, it's attainable. You can get there. It will be hard at first, but worth it. Without love for yourself, you leave yourself open for that sensation of shame to creep back in. Without love for yourself, you can never be whole. Don't get me wrong, lying by omission isn't always bad. There are times when it's better to keep things to ourselves, when who we are or what we are keeping secret actively puts us at risk. Only you can decide if harboring those secrets is worth the pain you're putting yourself through. Whether you decide to speak your truth or not, though, you must always remember that you are not evil. Who you are is not something you should have to hide. And most importantly, if you do decide to tell your truths and people react negatively, recognize that the problem is with them. Do not let their prejudice get inside your head and haunt you. Enough people are going to want to hurt you in this life. There's no point being one of them yourself.